Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Here we are again for another week of fantastic questions. We've got some great ones for you this week. We are coming to you a little bit earlier than usual. Uh, once again, it's been the same for the past few weeks. Um, I've been super busy. I've been traveling a lot. I've been at different kendo events all over Europe, <laughs> like every weekend since I got back from Japan. So things have been a bit crazy. Things are starting to settle down this weekend. I'm away uh, for the last, last one for a while, so be back to normal after that. We'll be back to our regular programming. <laughs> I mean, today's Thursday. Normally, this would be coming to you on a Friday. And from next week as well, you'll be getting the uh, feedback videos. Again, I've got some uh, ready to do. And um, that's the videos where, you know, people send in videos of them doing kendo and I give them some feedback and we all watch and learn from them together. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I know I've been saying for a while, I'll be doing that again soon, but I'll be definitely doing it from next week. Okay. <laughs> no doubt about it. Okay. I've got more content coming too. I've got a great kata video in the works uh, and I've got more stuff coming as well. Uh, now, before we jump into these questions, don't forget, you know, the YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe, all that sort of thing. But most importantly, Make sure everyone's a winner by shopping at kendostar.com. Kendostar, of course, is my website, so I would tell you how brilliant, amazing, fantastic, and stupendously awesome it is. Of course, I would say that because I own it, but everyone agrees with me, so shop at Kendostar. You support the channel, you get great equipment, the best equipment, you get fantastic service as well. Nobody beats us for that. So, shop at Kendostar. <laughs> all right, let's get to these questions. We've got quite a few. All right, so let's get let's get cracking. Right, so <clears throat> so um, I'll try and speak a little bit slower. I had a bit of feedback that I speak a little bit fast, um, which I know isn't ideal for people whose first language perhaps isn't English. So I'll do my best to calm myself down. I get so excited. You see, <sighs> take a breath. You can always slow it down with YouTube if I talk too fast, but I'll do my best. Okay. Hi, Andy Sensei. I wasn't sure if this is appropriate for Kendall Rant, but I figured I'd ask anyways. In our area, within three hours, there are three main dojo, which have, uh, and which we've been to two. So far, we've heard how one dojo had to fire their sensei for being abusive. One of the other dojos just had, uh, just had a sensei basically push the students who was in charge out of the dojo um push sorry one of the other dojos just had a sensei basically push the sensei who was in charge out of the dojo because he had to move for work and wasn't making it to every practice okay every time we went to that same dojo a senior member would constantly talk about how much harder things were in a different state and how we don't learn as much because the sensei isn't tough enough then we've had a couple of uh, people practice with us who've been doing kendo for like 15 plus years. We basically tried to take over our dojo. Um, when I don't let them run everything, they get butthurt and stop practicing, okay? Uh, they would also talk bad about anyone who missed practice, even a practice even for a reason such as injury. From the same people, I'm constantly hearing, well, because I practice with this sensei, I'm better than people who practice with that sensei and so forth. I've, I've been calling it sensei shaming. <laughs> Um, our dojo isn't going to play those games. We learn from everyone and I've made it clear that every sensei is better than us. We, so we need to learn from everyone we can and the drama doesn't matter. I've decided it's not my job to make sure people come to every practice. It's just my job to help them improve as much as possible whenever they do show up. We're just here to do Kendall. My question is, is this level of drama common? We've butted up against it quite a bit since starting our dojo and it seems super odd and unnecessary. We don't let it permeate our dojo and luckily, because of our weird situation, we're pretty insulated from it. But I'm curious 
if this is something that's common in, in the Kendall community or we're in just a weird area. Thanks so much. All right. It's kind of common. This People love drama. There's two things. There's two things that people love, right? And I, I'm sure it's not just in Kendall, but there's two things that people love in Kendall. One is drama. Second is politics, right? <laughs> I don't know why. I hate them both, right? And I don't involve myself in either of them. Um, and, you know, the people that tend to love those things are the ones that tend to not have the great ability with the Shinai. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's... Uh, that's my take so far. Um, the, uh, you know, it is unfortunate. People people like to feel good about themselves. I guess they need some sort of validation, whether that's sort of whinging about something, creating drama like this or chasing some sort of, I wouldn't say power, but a feeling of power because there's not really any power in, you know... <laughs> in Kendall politics. Um, <clears throat> so look, there's a few things that I think I'd talk about from this. I think, I think you're doing the right thing for a first, for, for a start by just not involving yourself in it. Um, <clears throat> when, you know, this is, this is kind of nonsense when they're saying like, oh, uh, it's better in a dif different place because, uh, <clears throat> they have a tougher sense of, it's like, well, it's not really how it works, right? Of course, you know, Sensei is a brilliant resource for learning, but like, I think there's a massive misconception and it, this isn't like unique to like the West or something. I think it's in Japan too. But like the brilliant Sensei doesn't equal you will get better at Kendo because most of the effort has to come from the individual rather from the Sensei. All right. So it's not the sensei's responsibility. Now they're, they're a fantastic resource and the better resource that you can get access to, obviously the better chance you've got, but that's nothing without the sort of, um, hard work on the individual side. Um, and that's, you know, and saying that, you know, you, you don't, it, it's wrong to say that it's not possible to still, you know, really improve and really work hard, regardless of the, I hate to use this term, but the level or the ability of the, the sensei that you're working with. It's kind of irresponsible. Um, just to say, well, I'm not as good as I could be because I don't have a good sensei. It's basically what they're saying. It's like kind of making an excuse for himself. So, you know, um, it's like in Japan, too. You know, lots of foreigners move to Japan and expect to automatically get better at Kendo and a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. Uh, and a lot of them move to Japan and find it's harder to get better at Kendo because there's a language barrier. There's people, it's harder to get into sort of um, the right circles to really improve. Uh, it's very, very hard actually. And, you know, you can go and practice with the be like a, a, a super awesome Hachinan sensei every day. It doesn't mean that you're going to get be better at Kendo. What, 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 you know, what is necessary is how you uh, uh, apply yourself to that situation. So, yeah. Um, and I think as well, um, you're doing the right thing, you know, just you know, you've set up this dojo, you're running this dojo, and just because someone's been doing kendo longer than you, doesn't mean that they get to take over. Now, I've had this as, I've not had this myself, I've not had this myself, because um, I'm uh, I'm in a bit of a different situation, because I moved away to Japan, and then I came back, and when I came back, I was fifth dan, and then shortly after coming back, I achieved the sixth dan, which in, in the community I'm in, is considered a high grade. Um, so, and I set up my dojo after already doing that. So even the P there's, there's because, because the country I live in, Kendo is a very, very, very small activity. You know, there's not many, there's not many people who've got high grades, um, in the area. So even if somebody came that had been doing Kendo for longer than me, it was easy for me to not let them. Not that they'd even try or anything, but not, you know, not to feel like they should take over or something like that as well. 
um, simply because I had this sort of rank, uh, which ironically is something that people only really care about in the West. But anyway, um, <laughs> so that's a whole different rabbit hole going down there. Um, but it's your dojo. It's your dojo. It doesn't matter how long, you know, if I turn up there, let's say, or someone who's seventh dan turns up there, if the, they're a guest in your dojo at the end of the day. And if you say to them, you know, oh, please, please lead the class today, run, run our class today or something like that, that's different. But they don't get to automatically assume that. They don't get to automatically assume that, all right? And it's sad. It happens a lot. I've seen it a lot. I've seen it a lot, all right? And, you know, some again, it goes back to this people that are sort of chasing power. They think that getting high grade gives them some sort of uh, special status. It's really just a signifier of how long they've been doing Kendall, to be honest. Um, so, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, let's stop there. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's your dojo. You should run it how you want to. And if, if you want to let a, a guest run the class, you should. If you don't, if you want to run it your way, run it your way. And that's, you know, and they can either come or not come at the end of the day. Uh, and this sensei shaman, I love that word. That is total rubbish. That is total rubbish. The best sensei in the world have some rubbish students. All right. A sensei is not responsible for every, the ability of every person that's practiced with them or, or, or I hesitate to use the term learnt from them. But um, we're doing a lot of air quotes today. Uh, <laughs> um, but as you know, you don't learn kendo through osmosis. I mean, there's an element of it, but there's a there's a technique to to acquiring that too so um saying well i practice with this sensei so i'm better than you because your my sensei is better than yours it's like my dad can beat up your dad sort of thing it's like i think you need to go back and read the uh the old uh concept to kendo to be honest uh so as it's said in japanese the um mm, it's it's rubbish, isn't it? It's rubbish, and I'm. And you're right. You shouldn't play those games. Don't don't you know? Um, don't get involved in that. Don't get wrapped up in it. Yeah. Um, and I think you're doing a sterling job. Really, really good job. So it is common. I'm afraid. Best way to handle it is exactly how you're handling it right now, and just just don't 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 have it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, next. One. Hi Andy, I have a question for Kendall Ran. Do you know who nowadays is the senpai of all Hanshi? Who's the Kenshi with the more years training? Thanks. <laughs> it doesn't really work like that either. Um, it doesn't necessarily really work like that either. So um, there isn't one like, you know, head of the Jedi Council, one Master Yoda. There's not like that. It doesn't really work like that. Um, there's several of them, obviously, that are of a certain generation. And there's still a few ninth dans left, right? Hanshi ninth dans, right? So obviously, uh, they are... Um, they're at the top, aren't they? Really. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I guess they're the, the top Hanshi, aren't they? The ones that have got the ninth dan. Um, and I, I mean, most of them probably aren't really practicing all that much anymore because they're super old. But, um, you know, yeah, but I, it's not like, it's not like there's just one sat on a big throne. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a, there's a, I think I'd say there's a handful of them that are sort of in that echelon of, and it's not even just the, the Dan E either. I mean, I think the ninth Dan guys are at the top still cause they're like the oldest as well. Um, <clears throat> But um, then under that, there's there's people who were, you know. But I know if I know if uh, it's not even just off the rank, right? I've I've seen Hanshi Eighth Dan senseis, and I'm talking really famous ones, ones that everybody who's watching, not everybody, but lots of the people watching this will know who it is. So I'm not going to let you know who it is, uh, but. <laughs> If you can think of the most famous eighth dan uh, that you know, um, and I've seen a sense of that level, sort of 
bow bow their head and sort of I wouldn't go as far as carry the ball, but they would as much sort of use the really polite language and treat as the senior to someone who was like the seventh Dan. Um, because it wasn't about the Dan grade. It was about, he was the university, university senpai, I think it was. So he's the senpai still. So it doesn't go just off the grade. Yeah. Like in the, the thing is, is in the West, I'm not going to rant on this. 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 But in the West, or outside Japan, we do not have the same concept of what in Japanese is called the joge kanke, the cultural hierarchy. So we don't we don't have that sense, but it exists in kendo, and in Japanese society, there's lots of points in which that the placings in that hierarchy are determined, and Danny isn't really one of them except in cases of like mainly like eighth dan is considered as pretty pretty awesome but like the uh, there's lots of other factors that come before dan grade when they're determining who's the senior and the junior um and uh but in outside of japan we don't have that as part of our cultural like um you know, system. So um, when it comes to kendo, we only have the dan grade, the dangi, to use as a metric for it. So that's why we attach a lot more to the value of the grades, especially the higher grades, like sixth dan, seventh dan, um, which like in Japan is not nearly as, there's not nearly as much emphasis placed on it. Um, you know, like... Three weeks in Japan, I, I, I don't know if I said this in a previous rant, but three weeks in Japan over the new year doing kendo a lot. And like I was asked for my Dan grade once and it was by someone who didn't do kendo. Right? Someone found out I did kendo and they asked me what my Dan grade was. Um, And you could tell them Nidan and they'd be impressed because they don't understand how the Danny works. So, <laughs> right? But nobody in kendo asked um the only people who talked about dan grade was it was like oh there's a hatidan sensei over there or whatever there's a hatidan sensei coming to this part so they only talk about hatidan um in most most situations so it's kind of strange kind of strange <laughs> what i'm saying is is you've got to kind of keep a little bit grounded i think that's, that's a different rap hole. Anyway, uh, after me, Sensei, I'm going to be cheeky and ask two questions. That's okay. That's what we're here for. I'm attending practice and seminar with an eight dance Sensei later this month. Uh, I heard conflicting ideas about the way we should conduct ourselves uh, with a very senior Sensei, both with the training and seminar itself and before and after. Uh, two, I've been asked to organize a big cake or to try and build some connections between our dojo and the rest of um, the Midlands. Uh, we have a few higher grades who will be taking the actual sessions but what advice can you give on organization such of such an event and getting the word out many thanks okay so um in terms of the conduct around this very senior sensei um it's hard to explain but just try your best to be as humble as possible and they're going to be a japanese sensei right so Obviously, they're not expecting you to sort of work in a Japanese way, but they do, for, to some extent, expect to be looked after a bit. So, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I don't know how much you're involved in organising things, but I just make sure that, like, he knows exactly where he's got to be, what time, how he's going to get there, who's going to help him get there inside the dojo what the schedule is and what what you know that isn't so there's nothing that could cause him any sort of confusion or like what's going on uh sort of thing um and to sort of during the training you know just make sure that you're paying attention as much as possible uh, and trying your very best and um, when it comes to cake or don't just try and beat them up and impress them because that isn't how generally eight dance feel impressed with you um 
and so yeah that's that's what i'd sort of say on that um about organizing the big kick or uh and build connections um so yeah i mean book a hall <laughs> find pick a date that's appropriate book a hall and um invite everyone use facebook i think is still the best way to do it i know there's like newer social media apps that are popular with the young kids but um but most of the high grades aren't young kids, right? So, <laughs> so Facebook's a super useful one. Um, I'm doing a similar thing in the Northwest. Uh, you say you're in the Midlands. I'm up in the Northwest of the UK. I can tell you're in the UK from the way you're talking. But um, uh, so I, I organize a, a sort of semi-regular um, gold or gay course so it's just i just hire a hall for two hours tell everybody the date and time uh, it's on a weekday evening um that's in a sort of central position to everybody so everyone can pretty much come as much as possible uh book it for two hours and just invite everybody and hopefully everyone comes and it's it's just there's no cake or plan it's just a, it's just two hours free practice and as it's mainly like usually like it's, most people are like second down and above that are coming and um, people are able to look after themselves a bit so you don't have to sort of hold the hand and tell them what to do um and it, it you know we've done it twice so far and it's been super good so um i'd like to keep keep that up and i think it's a good thing to do it's it's great to and you know in a small community like the uk um we, we everyone has to work together um, and I think it's really important for the higher grades to work with each other as well um, so that they can keep improving because we're the only resources we've got, you know. Um, I hesitate to sort of put myself in that category of higher grade, but it's, it's technically, yeah, it's technically what it's called, isn't it? Um, with increasing numbers of younger Western people passing sixth and seventh dan, it seems inevitable we'll see an increase in eighth dan who are not Japanese or Korean over the next 20 or 30 years, at least an increase beyond the current total of one. How do you think uh, that will affect development of, of the Kendo community internationally, and the current dynamic between Western Kendo associations and the ZNKR? That's a good question. Uh, I think there's more than one non-Japanese or Korean um, Hachidan, uh, actually. Um... I think there's a hand, there's a there's a few, um, is only a few. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's there's at least one from Taiwan. Um, I know there's uh, there's the sort of a very international sensei as well. Uh, it's lived in lots of places, uh, and there's uh, there's a few. Um, it seems inev inevitable we'll see an increase in eighth dan and not Japanese cream. Mm. I'm not sure it does. <laughs> I don't know. Obviously, at some point. I, I, I guess it is, it's inevitable. Yeah, we'll see an increase in it. I don't think that's because we're seeing more Western and younger Western people passing the 6th and 7th down. Um, I think it's a complicated subject. Um, but the... In my opinion, from what I can see so far, the gap between Shodan and Nanadan is smaller than the gap between Nanadan and Hatidan, right? So, mm, getting loads more Nanadans doesn't necessarily would def mean we're definitely getting more, um, getting more eight dans. Um, I think it is inevitable, but I think there's there's an issue, right? There's an issue that's behind the scenes, and we can say it's right or wrong or whatever, right? But let's 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 just put that issue to one side for a minute, whether it's right or wrong. But the fact of the matter is, is as I just said before, in Japan, Dan grade isn't it's not not cared about. It's nobody. It's not nobody cares about it. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother with it. But it's the importance isn't placed on it in, uh, until you get eighth dan, right? And you see that because you know there's there's all different sorts of sixth dans and seventh dans over there as there is everywhere. Um, there's all sorts of them, right? They're not all like amazing, like police former police officers, you know. Um, but. Eighth dan's a bit different. Now within eighth dan, yeah, there's 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 some differentials too, but 
getting over that eighth dan barrier is something yeah you, there's got to be something special about you um and that achievement is recognized differently than the others uh, and as such it comes with more influence than the others do all right once you get the eighth dan wherever you're from in japan i'm talking in japan at the moment wherever you're from you've suddenly got a whole lot more influence in that area all right so they're very careful about who they are giving that influence to um so this is yeah it's really a question of whether they are ready to let because what it means is right i'm speculating here i'm speculating i'm not saying this is definitely the case but this is this is how it appears to me at my current state and this isn't a criticism it's just how it appears but let's say you've got some european or it could be american or wherever nana dan whereas in you know kyoshi nana dan and in, in their country they are like They've got a lot of influence. They've got a lot of people listen to what they're saying and all that stuff. We put them in Japan, the, the, the ten a penny, right? Put them in Japan, the ten a penny. No one cares what they've got to say, right? It's not nobody cares, but like Zenkenen doesn't care what they think, right? <laughs> Unless they've got a very specific field of expertise that isn't necessarily kendo related, like from something else. Like let's say they're a, just just picking out the top of you know top of my my head here say they're like a cyber security expert and the zenken then wants their opinion on how to secure the website then they'll listen to them right but they're not going to ask them for to to get involved in um in let's say meetings or uh conferences or seminars regarding what direction they should take the competitive rules in or something like that right they're not going to do that right because they don't care what they have to say right <laughs> so what once once they put someone to eighth dan they're getting closer to the point where they've got sort of a voice in the room um and i'm not sure whether they're ready to give out many of those voices to kendall cuff from overseas because there's so much difference in the what can I say? The there's there's such a disparity in the way kendo is practiced in Japan and outside of Japan. It's 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 vastly different. Okay, so hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm this is this is I'm just I'm just speculating. It's in no way criticism. Saying Ken Ren, if you're listening, I'm not criticizing. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't take away my shoulder. No, I'm joking. They're not like that. But um, the uh, <laughs> um, I'm not criticizing. I kind of get it if I'm honest. But it's like I, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure Hatidan is ready to be dished out like that. I might be wrong, All right? And I think that um what it needs is for <clears throat> a sort of non-Japanese or Korean or whatever sensei, like the ones that have, to prove that they are a voice that, or, or someone that, that if they elevate to that status, isn't going to be a problem, but is going to be a, a benefit. And that's, that's a difficult thing to judge all right it's a difficult thing to judge and yeah mm. let's probably stop there <laughs> on that one <laughs> all right <laughs> i've got quite a lot of thoughts about it but i'm not sure i've totally collected them either so you know this video is probably gonna come back to me in five years and someone's like you said this in 2023 though Hello, Sensei. Hope you and your family are well. I'm curious as to the correct Deho slash Deho uh, in terms of the Sensei. I think you. Uh, anyway, did you mean to put Deho and Negi? Maybe Deho and Negi? Maybe? Let's pretend you did. 
Uh, in terms of the sensei side at the end of practice and a seminar, is there a particular order in which they sit? I expect most senior in the middle, but then who sits which side? Also, when they turn to bow to one another, uh, do they bow to each other or do they turn to face the center and all bow at once? I guess they all move uh, the shinai 90 degrees left and right when they move. Just a bit curious, really. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, so this is a really interesting one because there's no... This isn't regulated and there's no set answer. It's based on the traditions of each dojo. Now, in gen generally speaking, right, a dojo has a, like, um, a kamiza and a shimoza, like, so a, a high side and a low side, right? And the highest... And this isn't actually just kendo thing. This is like a Japanese cultural thing. All right. So the oku, the the oku is like the the back, like the back in the back, <laughs> um, is like the most senior place to be. So even this is this is in this is in general life too, right? If you go like for a, a meal with your colleagues, your boss sits in the most like oku <laughs> like so like if there's a table with six chairs on they sit in the one that's in the furthest away from the the door often um and it i i, I heard it stems from like samurai cultures so of there's someone invaded to attack them there's lots of people to defend them i don't know if that's true or not but it sounds kind of cool so let's go with that and uh, the uh, in the dojo is the same. So the highest point should be the furthest from the entrance. Okay. Um, however, it's not always done like that. Sometimes the highest grade sensei will sit in the middle and the lower is either side sort of evenly. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the... Um, I've seen where... Um, it depends as well where they place the, if they have a shomen or a um, kamidana, like a, a little shrine. Lots of dojos have a little shrine in Japan. Um, and often, like I was in a dojo in Japan where you'd go in and the uh, the it was on the right hand side was the, was the kamiza. The, the, actually, because that's where the shomen and the, um, what's it was, the, the shomen and the, Kamidana and stuff like that. So what the way that dojo was is that on the side where the entrance was, that was the Shimoza. So that's where the juniors would sit. The opposite side was the Kamiza, which is where the seniors would sit. And then on the right hand side where the um, actual showmen was, the Hachidans would sit there. The highest grade ones would sit there. But only the Hachidans would sit there. So sometimes they separate that. In my old dojo, when I lived uh, in Kyoto, they had a similar sort of thing, but it was, um, uh, yeah, it, it, on like on the like uh, the the far wall that was just guests. So if you were just visiting, you would sit there. So this is all different ways. It depends on the uh, it depends on the traditions of each dojo, and the same goes for when they turn to bow to each other as well. Um, some just bow all facing towards the center. Some bow to the center and then turn to bow to each other as well. It depends. It's up. It's it's up to how that dojo's traditions are. All right. There's no right or wrong way necessarily. I mean, there's wrong ways, but you know, you get what I'm saying. Okay, which says a an an ippon is a point awarded in a shiai. Strike has to be a valid strike or a yu ko datotsu for the ippon to be awarded. Okay, so yu ko datotsu means valid strike. Are these terms interchangeable? I've heard some sensei say when talking about practicing kihon is spelled with an I. Doing this grammar check here. Spell check. Uh, to practice all the uh, um, elements of a valid strike, so your strike is ippon. Do they mean so that your strike will be an ippon in the shiai? Or is it the same as saying you call that otsu? Sorry if I went in a circle. So it's a very confusing and grey area. All right. I've heard senseis talk about how like ippon is like a class above the you call that otsu. It's like the perfect you call that otsu. Um, but in, in sort of co common usage, 
It's not really what it means. Uh, Ippon means one. Um, and uh, the E, e <laughs> the E from, um, if you were to write it in Japanese, all right, this is where we're getting into Japanese class with a imperfect Japanese speaker here, but um, it's Ichi and Hong. Uh, this is how you write Ippon in Japanese here, okay? Ippon, okay? And it's Ichi, which is a number, and Hong, which in this case is a counter, all right? A counter. Japanese have lots of these. Super annoying because they have them for all sorts of different things, like uh, so that you can tell like what they're counting, all right? So in this case, it's it's like in in uh, in in uh, points. It's or, or it's like this is often used for this hon is often used for like long cylindr cylindrical stuff or stuff like that as well. Um, so like shinai, shinai sanbon, three shinai, like sort of thing. Um, and they use it in kendo, they use it for suburi as well. So they don't generally say like, you know, shomen suburi niju kai. Kai would be times, right? Uh, they normally say niju bon, so 20 times, but it, 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 it's like, yeah. <laughs> It's difficult to explain, right? But in technical sense, the ippon is the 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 the, the uh, like the counter for the points in this case, I think. So generally, the term you call that is more appropriate. Let's have a look in the book. So I'm make sure I'm not telling telling nonsense. Okay, so I've got the uh, official guide for canon instruction. I don't have the the dictionary here. Um, it's at, the, it's at the office, but um, interestingly, in the glossary section of this, there isn't, uh, Ippon is not in it, okay? Ippon is not in it, all right? Um, I'm sure it's in the dictionary, all right? But uh, you call that what it is, all right? You, that's Zanshin in it. You call that what it is, all right? You call that what it is. And it says, a valid strike, a valid strike which is considered Ippon, okay? So strike that is, can be awarded as Ippon or considered as Ippon. Um, and that, so it says here, if the needs, if the necessary conditions are met, Ippon is also given in the following cases. So Ippon is the point that's awarded. It's sort of in the context of this. Ippon is the point that's awarded. You call that otter is the act itself of achieving a valid strike. All right. So you do you call that otter and you are awarded Ippon. Okay. That's how that works. Does that make sense? There's probably other interpretations too, all right? They're, they're kind of interchangeable in real life. <laughs> all right, you call that us is probably the better one to use. Okay, next one. Okay, hi Sensei, how to tape the feet to prevent blisters. I saw some methods online, but I might not be a fan of those. Okay, so, um, mm, depends, depends where you're getting the blisters. If you're getting it on your big toe, then get a bit of zinc oxide tape or something like that. We sell some tape on Kendo Star too. Um, and just wrap it around the big toe before you start Keiko. All right, I usually do that just to stop um, my, my skin splitting at the base of my big toe. On my left foot, it happens to me quite a lot if I do a lot of Keiko. So I do usually do that as a preventive measure. Um, but if you're getting blisters like on the soles of your feet and stuff like that, it's really just a case of you're not that you know, your feet aren't used to it yet. And it could be that your left foot is turned out, all right? If your left foot's turned out, you get, you'll get you get blisters, all right? It's hard to wrap tape around your whole foot when you've got blisters. I've done it before, but I wouldn't go into the method of how to do it because I kind of made it up on the spot. So, um, yeah. <laughs> if you feel like you're getting blisters, go back and address your footwork, I think is the, is, is, is the first answer, all right? No, it's not the one you want. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, I since I keep getting extremely winded during practice and it's get it gets hard to keep pushing myself because I can't breathe. First, I assumed it was a matter of my, mo my body not being in shape enough, but I've been at it nine months now despite seeing physical changes in my body, weight loss, muscle growth. The problem persists, so I'm pretty sure it's my asthma. I'm going to consult my doctor about it 
Uh, but while doing some Googling about asthma medication during sports, I was surprised to learn that several sports have regulations and limitations on the usage of asthma medications. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem for normal practice, but it's something worth knowing if I ever participate in a competition. Would you happen to know anything about that in regards to Kendo? If not, no worries. I'm sure I can consult with the Federation or something. So, okay. First. Nine months ain't quite long enough for your body to really get used to it, all right? Unless you've been doing Kendo five days a week. If you're doing Kendo five days a week, cool, all right? You get it. But if you're doing line once, twice a week, even three times a week, you're still getting used to it, all right? Your body is, you still not learn how to properly control your breathing. Um, you still not fully learn how to properly control your breathing. It takes a while to do that. So, and to be honest, to be honest, you know, you get, what happens is, you, you know, you, you tend to always get to a point where you're really out of breath. Um, it's just, it takes a bit longer to get there, the, the longer, the more experience you've got. But if it is indeed something to do with your asthma, which could very well be, talk to your doctor about that. Um, I wouldn't worry about your asthma medication. I really wouldn't. Look, if you're going to, if you're going to participate in the world championships, then that's the conversation you're going to need to have. All right. That's the conversation you're going to need to have. But. If you're talking about like at your local federation tournament or something like that, they're not going to be doing doping tests. Now, I'm not saying you should go and do some steroids or something like that to beef up or something. I'm not saying that. But what you're talking about is a, legit, uh, a legitimate medical medical requirement to take something, all right, that's not really going to enhance your performance, yeah? Not to the point where you're going to be sort of smashing national team members and stuff like that. You're, you're like nine months in, right? If you start in the future looking at getting really serious about competition, and I mean like really serious, competing a lot, really looking at, you know, doing well in tournaments, then that is going to be something you're going to have to address, yeah? Because whether whether they do doping tests or not isn't what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is like, if you're doing the odd tournament once or twice a year at a local level, I don't think it's a major problem, but if you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna start regularly doing it and start looking at shooting for your national team, then you're gonna have to look at that, find out if the medication you're taking is is on is on the list or not, and if it is, you're gonna have to talk to your doctor about what you can do about that because there's obviously other athletes that are dealing with the same issue that are complete competing at elite levels. There's, so you know you've got to find out what the way to go around it is. But I think you just a bit, it's a bit early for you to start worrying about that right now. Right now, just getting getting to through getting through Keiko and getting into some Shiai is, is the goal, all right? And if you need your medication to do that, do that. And then later, if it starts to become a really serious thing for you, competition, I mean, <clears throat> then you can cross that bridge at that point, all right? Uh, hi, Andy. My question is regarding the differences between the Kamui Borga set and the Praetor. I understand that the latter is more close to the Kaise, but seeing the prices, the Kamui is not far from the Praetor around... 160 euros difference. Uh, by the way, he's still producing Kaise, thanks. Okay, Kaise is a discontinued bog set. Um, I discontinued it um, about a year ago, I guess, uh, because I felt it was just a little bit too close in concept to the Praetor. Um, I thought we developed the Praetor after the after the Kaise, um, and I, I felt like the, the concepts were sort of overlapping a little bit, and the sort of Praetor was a little bit more in line with... Um, with the Vanguard series concept in itself. Uh, the Kamui is uh, quite different to the Praetor. The Kamui uses a, a, like a double stitch. I don't have one here, but like a double cross stitch pattern. So it's it's like stitched vertically and horizontally. And the, there's two rows of stitching in each grid. Um, it looks super awesome. It's, it is a great, great Borg set. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, it's not quite the same as how the Kaise was. It's similar in terms of the way it's stitched. Yeah, I get that. Um, it uses all synthetic deer skin though, whereas the Praetor and the Kamui used to use these genuine deer skin. So that's the reason for the higher price on those ones. Um, the 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 price uh, of the Kamui is a little bit higher than some of the other synthetic sets because it it comes with some uh, standard upgrades that don't come with the others. It comes with an upgraded door straight away for example so it comes with some more expensive features too but it isn't quite the same concept as the as the Praetor the Praetor is a much more sort of 
prestige type set. It's got the full deer skin. It's sort of a little bit more, I hesitate to say traditional, but it's it's like that sort of premium style set. Whereas the, pre, uh, the Kamui is a little bit more like a kind of modern, very matte looking uh, kind of sleek bog set. And um, so they've got quite a different aesthetic um they're both fantastic sets uh if you can afford the praetor it is a better set um by virtue of the fact it's it's made from better materials um and the comedy is a great set too so you know if you prefer the look of the comedy go and grab the comedy it's a great set too um in terms of the kaiser we still producing we're not still producing it no um we have a new series of borg coming out oh, i'm letting the cat out of the bag we have a new series of Borg coming out this year. It's a premium line. Um, so before anyone asks me, should you wait for it? Um, if you're looking to spend more than what the Praetor is, then get in touch and we can talk about it um, because that's where it's coming in at, all right? It's not a, it's not an entry-level series. Um, it's like, you know, we've got the Kinjirushi Shinai. We've got that slightly higher grade of Shinai. We're doing a sort of similar thing with the Borg. We've got a... We've got a, a really nice series of uh, Borger coming that's like in the premium line. All right. Um, I'll talk more about that when it's when it's ready to come. All right. But yeah. Uh, hello, Sensei. I hope all is well with you. One, how would you explain the way one launches off the back foot to a child? Not the most athletic person. Two, what do you suggest to make one Shinai move before the feet? I keep moving my body before I start to move my Shinai. Thank you. Um, one. Depends on the age of the child. Um, I'm not sure I'd explain too much. Uh, just make them do it. Just make them repeat. Just make them do loads of what you call me. <laughs> um, show them. Show them. Just say, do it like this. Push off your left leg like this. And then get them to try and do it. And then just, just, just make them keep doing it. The thing is, there's no point, like explaining in depth to a kid they don't have the sort of a attention span to sit there and listen to a lecture um you just have to make them do it just make them do it repeat 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 and then um be patient because they're not going to improve fast kids don't kids improve very slowly all right there's there's this sort of idea that kids learn so fast they don't they not in kendall yeah i mean they, do, they just don't learn as as fast as as adults because they don't process the information in the same way um, and it's the same in Japan that's why what they do they get the kids when they're young and they just make them repeat over and over and over and over and over and then the, some kids get really good and some kids sort of fall off yeah <laughs> and that depends on on the kid themselves um, so you know and yes you need to explain a bit but you don't need to lecture them like you do with adults so much okay just get them to get them to repeat and just get them to stick at it and then it should bring itself together um over time um in terms of making the shinai move before the feet i'm not sure that's the best thing to do i generally recommend moving the feet and the body before moving the shinai um except if you're doing large swings if you're doing large swings if you're doing large swings then yeah you need to stay in your kamai raise the jaw down and then go all right first basic stuff do it in two-step motion lift men lift men all right then once you can do that you can start to make it a bit more ichibyoshi but it's still lifting men 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 all right practice that all right then when you start doing the small swings you want to start moving your body first your feet first particularly all right Right, you start moving your hands first, your shinai first, they're going to see where you're coming. All right? They're going to see where you're attacking. So it depends on the type of cake what you're doing. Okay? Makes sense? Hope so. <laughs> are we at the last one? I think we're at the last one, and it's a mega one. It's a bumper one. All right, all right, okay, good. Because I know I've been going on for quite a while now. So, hi, Fifth Sensei. I just received my Vanguard Sentinel yesterday. Oh my God, I, can I just share a bit of my excitement here first? I was wearing my Club Men Dawn Tari on my own. Uh, tari is spelled with an E, by the way. It's Tare, not Tari. Still in Japanese. Tare. Uh, and my own Vanguard X Protective Kote, uh, which is 
Uh, this is where I come from. The men from the Sentinel on its own. I don't know what you did in terms of de design. How can I describe? The, nor the normal men looks like a tool helmet. The Sentinel men, men looks as if it's a living thing and has some kind of aura around it. It's just so beautiful. As I was keep getting out and just look at it as a piece of art. It does look great. The, the best, like the Sentinel burger. I'm super happy with the design of that. It's such a beautiful beautiful bug set. I absolutely love it. And it's designed to be, it's designed to be like a really good looking when you wear it, like you kind of look mean, like I love it, love it. Um, and the cut day from the Sentinel, although it said it might be a little bit stiff in a sale video, uh, but for me it's soft and straight out of the box and the Vanguard X Protective, okay, uh, which I've been using for two months now. Amazing, just amazing, good. Uh, before my question, I want to say something about Borga injury. I've been wearing Borga for two months, had two reasonable injuries. First one with Vanguard X Protective Cote, I got a hit on the middle finger knuckle. Next day it swelled up and uh, when I move my <laughs> middle finger, I can feel the joint bones squeak. Ooh. Second injury from wearing the club men after practice. I feel a pain on the top of my head. When I use a finger to press that area, it hurts more, so swollen head. My thoughts, I didn't expect Borga not as protected as it should be. Uh, no wonder so many people quit kendo after they start wearing armor. In my opinion, extra quality protection pad is a must. Good quality men is a must. I'm sure my Sentinel men will do that job. Uh, okay, my question. Okay, here we go. Uh, a minor question. I ordered Sentinel men. The men is black and black. When I received it, I realized the back of the IBB Mengane metal bars are red. I'm not complaining, just curious. It's a story about painting red inside the IBB bars. Thank you. Okay, cool. So let me address a couple of things, right? The Vanguard X protective Cote are a very protective set of Cote, right? So if somebody smacked you on the hand and still managed to make your middle finger swell up, they are doing it wrong. It is not the Cote that are a fault there, all right? I'm sorry, it is not the Cote that are a fault there. Um, there's the Borger, right? I don't know about the club men that you're wearing or whatever, right? Because it could be some cheap, cheap stuff from somewhere that uses like carpet underlay inside the burger. I'm not gonna name and shame where to do that, but you get what you pay for, let's put it that way. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy to blame the burger, <laughs> let's put it that way, right? But you're not supposed to smash each other with the shine, all right? You're not supposed to smash so hard that people are getting hurt, okay? So this is the problem that we have, right, um, is, I can make the most protective burger in the world, which we do. But if somebody's just being violent at you, you know, I can only do so much, you know. So, yeah. Anyway, um, about the member tree, all right? So, yeah, you ordered the black member So instead of red on the inside, it's black on the inside. Cool. Looks super cool, that. Love it. Um, <clears throat> the men gunner, though, yeah, it's still red on the inside. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One... One, there's a traditional reason why the Mengane are red on the inside, and it comes from the history of um, the Yoroi, the Japanese uh, armour. That was all often painted, no, it's not actually red, it's it's called Shuido, it's like, a, it's a kind of vermilion colour um, on the inside. Um, and that was said to reflect um, back to the skin and give you a more menacing appearance. Um, they also say that red on the inside of the men, uh, men gun is easier to see out of than a uh, uh, different colour. Um, I've used a different one. I've, I've used one that was unpainted in the past and it didn't seem that much difference in terms of it, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, but the, there's a practical reason as well, uh, and that is that um, men gun are... The men gun is made in like a batch of X thousand, all right? And they're all sprayed red on the inside, all right? They're all sprayed red on the inside. Then that is taken to the workshop, the men's built, and then they paint the membership, all right? So it's not painted after to match the men, right? They're already, they're all already painted red, okay? So from a practical sense, it is possible as a very custom uh, thing to try and get one that's, um, that's plain on the inside, um, but they're quite hard to get, especially in the IBB version. Um, so it's quite, no it's, it's very, very normal for the black member to have the red, red still on the inside of the Mengani. All right. Cause it is, the, there's a traditional reason for it. It's, it's part of, it's not, I'm not sure it's true that it makes you, you know, the, the, the changes your complexion, but there is a historical, uh, link there that I think is important to preserve, um, to be honest. So, um, 
that's one of the reasons I'm 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 sort of more keen to keep it. Um because I do think that the culture of Kendo is, is important as well. Okay. So there we are. We've reached the end of the show. It's been a long one. Thank you for joining me all the way to the end. We'll be back to normal next week. <laughs> Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Most importantly, shop at Kendo Star. Have a great weekend. Hope you're doing some Kendo. And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.